This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hi, and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist. I've lived and worked in Fayetteville, Arkansas for almost 30 years. Got my training at University of Texas Southwestern Medical School. I don't know why that's important today. (laughs) But five years ago, I decided to extend the walls of my practice to those of you who might already be very interested in psychological and emotional issues. Maybe you're in therapy And you're listening to podcasts, so I wanted to reach you. To those of you who might just have been diagnosed or you're looking for answers for some kind of question about yourself or a relationship, but also to a third group of you, to those of you who might say, you know, I think this psychology stuff is kind of for the birds, but you're interested enough or sadly unhappy enough to listen to self-work. You know, self-work isn't therapy, but at least it can give you an idea of what it might be like to talk to a therapist. I'm glad all of you are here. I want to thank Red Leo for this review on Apple Podcasts. This podcast has been super enlightening. It explains so much about what I do and what my family has done in regard to depression and perfectionism. Dr. Margaret's super insightful and very relatable. The episodes are bite-sized. See, that kind of thing is what I need to know and easy to consume in an on-the-go life. Thanks for all you do in the mental health field, Dr. Margaret. You've already started a tremendous healing in my life. I just get chill bumps when I hear something like that. To reach people via this podcast means so very much to me. And especially, I appreciate you letting me know how, really specifically, how it's helping you. So thank you so much. And of course, I'd welcome other ratings and reviews or subscribing wherever you listen to self-work. Or you can go to my website and subscribe at drmargaretrutherford.com as well, and you'll get a weekly newsletter with my podcast and blog post. So, okay, let's get on with today. A couple of times this week, a subject has come up, kind of synergistically. The first was through a listener email. The next was a question I got over an Instagram Live. Here's the question. How do I talk to someone about what's really going on with me? I'm scared they'll feel like I'm dumping on them. I'm feeling sorry for myself. Or even worse, I'm scared they'll take it on like it's their problem. So on Self Work Today, we're going to talk about this in detail. The why, the how, the who, the what, when, and where of sharing your story. Whether you're talking about past trauma or whether it's about something simply frustrating or somewhere in between. Now, I know some of you rarely, if ever, do that. I mean, share. And some of you may do it too much. So, we're going to talk about a middle ground. And how can you filter your own need to be listened to, to be understood, so that you set up a situation where you get what you want and need? Or, for those of you who may stay completely away from sharing your story, how can you begin to do it at all? And how can you begin to see its value? The listener voicemail is from someone who is looking at my Pinterest feed, and more specifically, the pin on Perfectly Hidden Depression. She took my questionnaire and was shocked by the score. So what should she do now? This is a question I get a lot, so I wanted to bring it to the forefront again today. You'll also hear today from Athletic Greens, or AG1, about their conservation commitment and how you can not only benefit from their product, but you can learn how they're trying, in turn, to benefit the world. So sit back and relax as we focus together on sharing the why, how, who, what, when, and where of sharing. And how do you know whether you're venting, dumping, or simply sharing your story? Probably all of you have had a friend at some point who text or call, and before you knew it, you were listening to a torrent of words explaining some story or another, telling you details that you didn't really want or need to know, and all without asking a word about you, or even asking if you had a minute, or if you were even in a place to hear what they wanted to talk about. The euphemism for this is oversharing. But it's horrible in a relationship. It can cause real damage because it usually signals that one person is doing most or all of the giving or the listening and the other is talking and receiving. 
and often repetitively. So eventually, the listener will burn out and dread those calls. That's when they themselves need to look at the reason why they're engaging in this behavior, why they're not setting better boundaries. Now, venting is something else. Venting is usually when you've had something come up in the present that's just too much. It's over the top. And you contact someone, you reach out to them and say, I just got a vent. (laughs) And out it comes. It's usually not something I pair with trauma. It's more spontaneous. It's more in the moment. It's the moments when you say, can the world give me a break? Or I don't know if I can hear about one more thing going wrong. Or I've had it with the kids. Or something that when expressed is very cathartic. And you feel better. And often it's followed with a word of gratitude. Thanks, I just needed to vent a little or let myself say those things. Venting is a passing thing. And we all need it from time to time. Now, there are other times when you're so angry and so distraught or grieving so deeply that emotions come roaring out of you. So fast and furious that you feel as if you have little control over them. All of us may need to scream or cry in those moments. Your anxiety or the felt need to relieve the pressure of holding those emotions in was too much. Now that can be venting as well, but it can pretty easily cross a line when it's done too frequently. But again, I think doing that every now and then is a helpful thing with people that you trust and you know that if they're in the same place, they listen to you as well. But when it's done too frequently, the not so fancy term for this is dumping And dumping is much more toxic than venting. Whoever's doing the dumping is usually taking a victim role. They say the same thing they did the last time they dumped. Or it's done without any heed of where the listener is physically or emotionally. You get dumped on whether you like it or not. Of course, here again, boundaries need to be set. And saying something like, I can't listen to you very well when you're this frazzled. Let's talk about this at another time. Or something even more clear... You know, I've seen you in this spot before, and you've handled it. And maybe you even give them an example of when they handle it. So you give the responsibility back to them for coping with whatever the dump is about, and then you get off the phone or the text or whatever it is. I've included an article in Psychology Today on this by Judith Orloff, and she's kind of a known expert about it. Now, when the dumping is about actual trauma, it's called trauma dumping. In a USA Today article, Judith Orloff, who I just mentioned, writes, People may feel better after trauma dumping, but the person they dump it onto feels horrible. They usually start to feel drained, and it's just too much serious, unexpected information at once. Remember, it totally comes out of the blue, and all of a sudden, you hear about this horrible thing, horrific thing, that happened to this person in front of you or on the other line or wherever the contact is. So trauma dumping is something that I've had patients do from time to time. Sometimes they don't realize they are doing it. Their trauma is so much a part of their story that when someone says, well, tell me about yourself, here comes the trauma. And I usually guide them to say, you know, you need to make sure you can trust this person before you begin talking about your trauma with them. Because, of course, what can happen is that person has not earned your trust and turns out to be not trustworthy after all. And they may use it against you. They may begin to preach at you or tell you you should have done this or you should have done that. And you've given them very private information that they're misusing and even trying to manipulate you with. So how do you decide when and where you need to share Let me point out from the very start, the fact that you're pausing and asking yourself this question means that you have a filter in place because you realize sharing is a choice. It's not impulsive or reactionary. Now, some of you listening may say, you know, I've never stopped to consider whether it's okay to talk about this or not. And that can be a problem because you run the risk of burning out the people who may truly care for you but who tire or feel overwhelmed by how much and how often you share about what's going on with you. Then, there are those of you who never share. Here's a segment of an email I got this week. The writer was saying that she identifies with perfectly hidden depression and has a great relationship with her partner of several years. 
Here's her quote. I don't know if he's really aware of how deeply depressed I am. I'm not sure why this topic is much more difficult for me to bring up. She was basically telling me that he has a history with her of being very understanding. I left out that part, sorry. Continuing with her quote. I know this is some of my own baggage to work out. Maybe I'm afraid of being too demanding or burdening him with my problems. Two narratives I've grown up to believe. You know, I'm not sure what I'm asking. I just know I'm in pain, and I don't know how to ask him for help in a way that feels comfortable or natural to me. Or, (laughs) maybe that's the problem. Wanting it to feel comfortable or natural when that's not possible. Bingo. I think she figured out her problem without me ever saying a word. Many people who share only certain things or don't share at all, and remember this woman had identified with perfectly hidden depression, so that's definitely one of her characteristics. They've learned that sharing is a negative or weak thing. It's being demanding or being a burden. And sometimes these folks have the habit of absorbing others' problems when they hear about them and take it on as their own then that's what they may fear others will do. People who identify themselves as empaths will tell you they can't listen to other people's emotions or emotional pain without absorbing too much of it. And really, they have to learn how to listen more cautiously so they don't get burned out. It's both a really wonderful skill to have, but it can be a problem as well. In that same USA Today article where we quoted Dr. Orloff, There's a psychologist named Dr. Manley. He points out another problem with trauma dumping. What if the person who's listening isn't in a safe or stable place themselves? He says, for someone who isn't psychologically stable, absorbing someone else's trauma is generally what happens rather than just listening to it. I can remember certain stories, for example, that I will not share on the air at all, ever, because they are such horrible stories mind-blowing, really hard to believe, but after being in the business for 30 years, not hard to believe, things that people have done, especially to their children. Those stories will stay with me, but luckily, I think I'm empathic, but I have some boundaries as well. So although I think about those stories from time to time, I have a place that I keep them. I have not absorbed them like they're my own, but not everyone has that capability. So, All of that said, and with some of you in the, I better listen to this episode because I probably do overshare, while others of you are in the camp of, I never let anyone know anything about me, then let's talk about the filters you might learn to use in decisions of why, how, who, what, when, and where you share. Before that, let's hear a quick message from yours truly and AG1, and they've got a gift to give when you first subscribe. And guess what? My gift that they gave me has lasted a full year. It's very cool. So give it a listen. Our partner, AG1, has a product I use every day. I started taking Athletic Greens, frankly, because they were interested in sponsoring self-work, and I never recommend something to you without trying it first. With one scoop of AG1, whose taste is somewhere between sweet and tart to me, You'll get 75 high-quality minerals, vitamins, probiotics, adaptogens, and whole food source superfoods, which support everything from your gut to your immune system to your energy level. I love it because whether I'm home and about to go out for a walk or traveling and about to spend time with friends and family, I can start my day proactively, knowing I'm doing something for my own self-care. If you're like me, self-care can get lost for sure. In fact, Its founder, after having severe gut issues, realized he was taking over $100 a day worth of supplements, which had their own very complicated dosage routine, so he created Athletic Greens. To make it easy, and because you're a self-work listener, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is to visit athleticgreens.com slash self-work. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash self-work to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. So let's break this down into the why, how, who, what, where, and when. Things that would be helpful for you to think about before sharing. Here's the why. 
It's one thing if you and your partner or friend have certain things you know and you can share. You've developed a trust in them and them in you, and you know they know how to listen. You can pretty well predict the kind of feedback you're going to get, how their experience defines both how they listen and how they respond. You both enjoy a give-and-take relationship. Sometimes you're the giver, sometimes the receiver or taker. Those are treasured relationships to have. You don't really need too much to probe the why of the telling here because you have a history together that you've worked hard to build and you can count on it. But asking yourself in other kinds of relationships, why am I feeling the desire or need to share this particular story with them, especially if it's a story of trauma? What purpose or function are you telling yourself it would serve? Maybe it would help them understand something about you. Maybe you want the relationship to deepen, so sharing something more private or painful might do that. Maybe you feel like they've misjudged you or your actions and you want to explain. All of those are reasonable, but what I'm suggesting here is that you stop for a moment and consider the why. If it has to do more with your own need to unburden yourself, or if you think something specific will happen if you do open up, like you'll make a friend forever or something like that, then you might want to wait a bit and reconsider until you know clearly what your purpose is. Remember, you're only in control of yourself. So you need to ask, am I seeing this relationship clearly or do I need to wait, give myself time to see it for what it truly is, not what I maybe want it to be? And is there an approximately equal amount of sharing going on already? And if not, then I need to rethink it. Now let's talk about the how. It's always good, I think, to ask first, do you have time to have a different kind of conversation with me? I'd like to share something with you I haven't before, or something like that. Again, we're talking about the how. This is called metacommunication, which is a big word for talking about talking. You're giving the listener a chance to say, no, well, of course, Uh, not now, but I'd love to tomorrow, whatever their response might be. What that also signals has to do with your why, the reason you're deciding to share. And you know if you can handle, "Mm, no, I'm not really interested in that, or not now, but I'd love to tomorrow, that it isn't on impulse. You can handle that response. You can wait. You can make sure your audience is clued in and seems willing to participate. So that's how you want to do it. You want to have these conversations with everyone on board and purposeful, you in the telling and them in the listening. So let's talk about the who. Deciding how much of a story or trauma you're going to reveal is also a product of who you're sharing it with. Hopefully therapists, especially ones who've been trained in trauma work, will not absorb your trauma. I just gave you an example of that in my own life. That's what makes that therapist safe. My job as a therapist is to provide that safe emotional space for my clients to talk about past trauma, present vulnerabilities and struggles, whatever they need to. It's literally like creating a kind of a holding tank or a holding space. I've had patients tell me that they need to leave whatever they're feeling or talking about with me in that space, like you'd leave a piece of luggage and come back to it. That's fine. It's compartmentalization on their part. They're leaving it with me. And that's healthy in this instance because they're coming back. It's like a metaphoric hold on that memory or emotion or experience for them. Some therapists aren't very good at this and are overly affected on a personal level. And that can really mess up therapy for you because they're getting in their own way. Now, please don't hear that I think I'm above all that. I've made my fair share of mistakes as a therapist. Friends can be the same way. They can absorb things without really even knowing they are. Family boundaries can be way too loose. And the pain you're trying to explain or reveal can somehow become your friend's problems or everybody in your family's problems. They need to feel them or fix them or both. And then something else just came to mind. It's also important that you don't personalize someone else not being able to share with you. Their who isn't you. And if you feel as if you're a person they should be able to talk to or tell anything to, then you're not respecting the boundary they need or decide to set for themselves. Not everyone has the same share yardstick. And because they can't or won't, it's a mistake to take that personally. 
Let it be instead information about them and just be patient. Maybe one day they'll be able to share. Maybe they won't. That's their choice. Okay, now for the what. This might be better labeled how much, but I've observed in my own patients and in myself that you need to decide how much you are comfortable sharing. For example, in the email I got from that listener, she could see for herself that her own level of discomfort was high when revealing that she struggled more with sadness or depression than what she looked like. She was waiting for it to become more comfortable. And my guess is that that wait would be really long. (laughs) Part of self-revealing is risk. And so the what or how much you reveal has to fit what you can tolerate. Let me say that again. The what or how much you reveal has to fit what you can tolerate. Remember, you're going to walk away from that conversation having shared something with someone else that's very private. Are you going to worry about saying too much? Will you toss and turn that night, wondering if you did the right thing? Perhaps revealing less than you might want to at first, you just edge into the risk, is the healthier decision. And you can say, I want to share more, but this is all I can say right now. And that's about me, not you. I just need to take this very slowly. I've had patients tell me that in therapy. I've had friends tell me that. I've said it to friends. And it's okay to set that boundary and only reveal what you feel very comfortable in revealing. The same goes for those of you who might be trying to learn to share with more discernment or more carefully. There's a listening exercise I often have couples do, and in the exercise, one of them is the speaker and the other the listener. I talked about this actual exercise in episode eight, so very early. There are a few rules of the exercise. One for the speaker is don't overwhelm your listener. You can't go on and on for 10 minutes or even five and expect them to be able to really listen carefully to you. Your choice could be to share in smaller bites and see the response you get. If it's please tell me more, or this is what I hear you saying, then okay. If instead they don't say much or aren't very receptive, then it may be a sign that your listener is overwhelmed. So you're monitoring not only the content of what you tell them, what you feel comfortable with, but what you can tell they feel comfortable with, or you can ask them, how are you doing with this? How are you handling it? They go, man, I don't know. Then you maybe need to stop and think, maybe I have not chosen well, or maybe this isn't the person that needs to hear about all this story. Okay, let's move on to the when. Now, this one is more simple. Timing is important, and both of you knowing what's about to be shared and both agreeing, yes, we can do this now, that's setting up the self-reveal for success. Please don't do it when you're angry or drinking or in a hurry or exhausted. Wait for a time when that give and receive dynamic can work the very best. The last but not the least is the where. Some people do just fine sitting across from one another and talking, but some folks don't. Try to be adaptable. (laughs) If you have teenagers, you know getting them in a car where they don't have to look at you can bring about some good discussions, even revelations. Maybe you're more comfortable going for a walk, then do it. Or maybe they're more comfortable if they're not just sitting and listening. Deciding whatever place and time you both feel comfortable sets that sharing up for success. Remember, it's the why. Why are you saying this? The how, maybe asking for permission. The who, making sure that the person you're choosing to talk to is someone you can trust and someone who will respect your boundaries and their own. The what you want to share, looking at content and maybe doing it in pieces or not all at once. The when and the where. I hope that's very, very helpful to you. Speak pipe message from drmargaretrutherford.com. Here's our listener voicemail. My name is Megan and I am 23 years old. I happened upon your, your list of silent depression on Pinterest and, um, I took your quiz and uh, I I was kind of shocked to see that I had 22 yes answers. And um, I'm a little bit concerned as uh, to everything now and I am unsure what to do 
or how exactly to go about it. I would just uh, really appreciate some guidance. This kind of shock is something I've heard from many people over the last couple of years. And I think it's due to the idea that many of the traits of perfectly hidden depression in moderation are quite healthy. And so it may never have been clear to the person that when found together, these traits might suggest that they're living an overly rigid, over-emotionally controlled life, and that that life could be unhealthy and even dangerous. You can feel a bit lost. Wait a minute. These are the things in myself that I've counted on that I see as part of my success. You're saying that maybe they're acting as camouflage for something I've never allowed myself to feel? It can feel pretty confusing. And then here's the other point that I've heard from some people who are complaining or criticizing my work, that I'm pathologizing, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, just getting on, being courageous. I don't think I am. I'm saying that true emotional well-being has at its core the ability to feel and work through all feelings, the joyful ones as well as the painful ones, knowing you have the skills to do that, to grieve to feel contentment, to be angry, to feel secure, to feel happy. All of those feelings you can handle and you know how to manage. And knowing you can do that gives you a freedom and security unknown to someone who might identify with perfectly hidden depression. So what should this person do? First, find out more information. Listen to my podcast, read my blog posts, all of which are free. And of course, I'm going to say, get my book, because it has 60 exercises in it for you to begin this self-exploration and lead you to some healing. See if you find yourself in its pages, as many have, or let me know they have. Read Brene Brown or Terrence Reels, I Don't Want to Talk About It. Seek therapy and let your therapist know how you responded to this strange questionnaire and what it stirred up in you. Hopefully you won't get a therapist who says, well, you don't fit the criteria for depression, but will think outside the DSM-5 box. And most importantly, try to allow yourself a moment or two to feel and to realize just how long you've been hiding. I had someone call what she's done for years, manipulating the narrative, making sure she only said certain things to certain people and other things to other people never letting anyone into her complete world so they would know what was truly going on. She's exhausted, and I'm honored that she came to work with me. So, good luck to this listener. Please let me know how you're doing, and know that you can get so much better. You can find self-compassion and self-acceptance. It's there, waiting for you. Thank you all for being here. It's always a privilege to know that you're taking a little time out of your day or week to listen to self-work. You can always email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com or leave me a voicemail message through SpeakPipe, which you can find in the show notes as well as on my website, drmargaretrutherford.com. I invite any of you to join my Facebook closed group at facebook.com slash groups slash self-work. Would love to have you there. My gratitude to you for being here. Please take very, very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self.